that. And uh, you can either record it. I can send it to you, whatever, whatever speaks to you, Edward. It's weird to talk to you after seeing all these videos. I, I get that a lot. It's kind of like <laughs> it's a weird thing. I was just doing a, it's weird because when I do classes now, sometimes it, the people don't know it's me that's teaching the class. And they go, oh, yeah, that guy on YouTube. I go, yeah, that's me. <laughs> so. There you go. You're, I just gave you permission to record. Thank you very much. And you have my permission too, if you'd like to share it with any test takers, uh, you're welcome to do so. Okay. Thanks. Hi, Dean. Hey, what's up? Good, how are you? Good, ready to do some munis? <laughs> yes. Muni, muni, um, okay. Yep, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, can we get permission to record as well? Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Let Thank you. Take that for you. Did you just hear what I told Edward as well? That, uh, you have you're, my permission to share it with other test takers if you'd like. Uh, okay. Uh, the other thing, Edward, I think you were a late sign up. The other thing you get as a alumni is you have uh, the ability to participate in our free office hours. That's the same way you booked this class would be the way you would book the free office hour. I cap that at five participants. And when we get to five, then I open up another office hour for that. You also have as a uh, alumni paid alumni the ability to when things are capped like this is a max of 10 we didn't hit our 10 today but if we had you are uh, i manually override it and let you get, come to anything you want to come to and then the last thing is you get free repeats so when we do repeats you are entitled to come if i put once we get done i'll put this back on the schedule at some point in the future and you're welcome to you know reattend if you'd like We'll just give people a couple minutes here. I got my doorbell going so we don't miss it. Okay, I think. If you just if you just checked in, you have my permission to record locally to your computer, and I'm recording because we uh, play these as replays for. Uh, folks who miss out so it's always better to be live I think because you have a question you can't really somebody said oh I finally get to see in person and the, you know when you're watching me in a video it's not like you you can hit pause and you can make a comment but you can't actually you know ask a real question of a video so and then sometimes the group dynamics a little better because if somebody has a question maybe it's a question you have a thought about and uh, you know maybe somebody else thinks about it so I'm a big fan of the old-fashioned group learning model uh, when when you can uh, take advantage of that all right, so on your immunity bonds, you could easily expect about uh, 20 questions on municipal bonds. So, you know, if you're taking a series seven, you're going to be, uh, your three big areas are going to be options, uh, munis, and mutual funds. If you can uh, get those under control, boy, it's going to be very forgiving in the other areas. You know, for example, you say, Dean, I'm totally clueless on margin. I say, okay, so you missed three points. You know, if you're clueless on options, munis, or mutual funds, it's going to be a, a long day, so to speak. And one of the biggest things you've got to be able to do on the test is contrast contrast geos with revenues. And so, what I highly recommend that you do you is take this. You, you know, well, I guess I'm going to have to meet you guys. Boom. Uh, I highly recommend that what you do is. Uh, Take a sheet of paper and fold it in half and on one side, write all the terms associated with GO and on the other side, all the terms associated with revenue bonds. Because, you know, a lot of your questions are going to be all the following are true of general obligation bonds, except or all the following true of revenue bonds or except or which of the following is true. So, you know, you want to, have, you know, have which one goes with which. Now, uh, there are two departments of major brokerage firms. I'll use Morgan Stanley, for example. You know, Morgan Stanley has corporate finance, men and women who raise money for municipalities. So we're first going to be talking about the primary market for municipal securities. You know, on your exam, you're held accountable for three issuers of securities, corporate issuers of securities, municipal issuers of securities, and the U.S. government as issuers of securities. Now, as it relates to uh, municipal and the government, they only issue debt securities. They don't issue equity. But if I work at Morgan Stanley in corporate finance, for example, the legendary guy, 
for corporate finance in Silicon Valley for Morgan Stanley is a guy named Michael Grimes. He's the Series 24, and he's in charge of tech banking. You know, he's the banker for, you know, Facebook, and he's the banker for uh, uh, Tesla. You know, a very popular guy, right? Because he raises money. You know, if Elon needs uh, $13 billion to take over Twitter, he calls Michael Grimes and says, hey, can Morgan Stanley do some bonds? But Morgan Stanley also has public finance, men and women who raise money for municipalities. And so, you know, maybe uh, San Francisco is considered raising some money. And if you're considering raising money in the city of San Francisco, you're going to call public finance at Morgan Stanley. And the city of San Francisco hires Morgan Stanley as a financial advisor. And uh, the city of San Francisco says to uh, Morgan Stanley, listen, we're trying to finance a alcohol rehab center in the city of San Francisco, and we're not quite sure how to go about it. And um, Morgan Stanley Public Finance says, uh, do you have a tax on alcohol sold within the city? And San Francisco says, yes. It brings in about $30 million a year into our general budget. I go, okay, well, if I'm a financial advisor working at Morgan Stanley, public finance, I said, well, listen, we don't want to mess with that. We don't want to mess with your general budget. Uh, but if I uh, do some, uh, crunch some numbers here, you know, what I would uh, suggest as your financial advisor is that maybe what you should do is sell some special tax bonds. You know, you tell the uh, bondholders that the special tax on alcohol, that sin tax, will pay the interest and in the principal on the bonds. So that would be uh, my recommendation for you. And the city says, well, gee, you have been so helpful. Can you underwrite the bonds? And I said, well, no, I can't underwrite the bonds. I'm not allowed to switch my roles. You know, the MSRB, the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board, thinks it's too much of a conflict of interest for Morgan Stanley to represent the issuer, city of San Francisco, represent Morgan Stanley, and then rec uh, re uh, represent Morgan Stanley's customers. And so, no, I'm not allowed to switch roles. Now, what I can do is help you uh, evaluate how best to proceed from here. For example, we might want to consider where you want to do this on a negotiated basis, you know, where you want me to call. Uh, I have some friends in the municipal business. Uh, why don't I call my uh, guy at uh, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and we can bring him in and uh, we can negotiate with Merrill about these bonds, how to best uh, sell the bonds. And I can help you in that. I can remain as your financial advisor. Well, needless to say, if I call the guy at Merrill Lynch a couple of times, he's not like me and I like him. I mean, and, uh, you know, uh, I say, gee, you know, uh, you've been so kind to me, the guy at Merrill Lynch. He says, hey, Dean, uh, well, uh, here's, uh, you know, $1,010, uh, $100 bills. Very testable. You know, the MSRB has A rules, D rules, and G rules. A rules are administrative rules, G rules are general rules, and uh, D rules are definition and G are general. So general, general rule number 20 says, the maximum gift or gratuity, chat is open, that an employee of one member firm, in this example, Morgan Stanley, can give to the employee of another member firm, in this example, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, is how much? Right on, Erica, 100 bucks, 100 bucks. Now, good news for you, you're not going to be taking a 24, maybe you will someday, or a 53 someday, but they're not going to get into these judgment questions about where I'm in violation of this rule. It'll be very clear. What I mean by that is it doesn't count normal deductible business activities. It doesn't count uh, reminder advertising. So now as your uh, financial advisor, we need to hire, test question, a bond counsel. So very testable to know that we're going to need a legal opinion. And the bond council is the one who is going to opine. You know, the largest bond council in the country is ORIC. ORIC is a law firm in San Francisco. They practice a lot of different law, but, you know, one of the areas of law they practice is uh, being as a bond council. So one thing I want to know as a potential underwriter of these bonds is that the bond council has opined that they're exempt from registration requirements of 33. Now, listen, this is a twofer. What I mean by that is learn this once, get tested twice. You know, and what I mean by that is it's testable on your seven. It's also testable when you go take your 63, 65, 66. You know, whether it's the state administrator or whether it's the SEC, they say, Dean, did you sell a brand new security to the public without providing a prospectus? I say I did. 
And you didn't register the security? I said, I did not. And they said, well, gee, well, how come you didn't register it? I say, well, municipalities are exempt issuers. They are allowed to sell securities to the public without making a registration statement. So very important. That means we're not going to have a prospectus. But we do, test question, have a very prospectus-like document. It serves the same purpose. It helps people make an informed decision. And very testable, that disclosure document is known as the official statement. Again, very testable. So one thing that the Bond Council is going to opine about is that they're exempt from 33. The second thing that the Bond Council is going to opine about is that the interest on the bonds is federally tax exempt. State and local depends on where you live and what kind of bonds you're going to buy. We'll talk about that later in our lesson this evening, but federally tax exempt because of constitutional law. You know, early on in American history, this isn't testable, but there was a bank authorized by Congress and the state of Maryland hated it. And they went to McCullough, the bank branch manager, and said, you owe $10 million in state income tax. And McCullough said, I don't think you can tax the federal government in the conduct of its business. This is a bank authorized by Congress and you do not have the authority to tax it. In a very famous Supreme Court case, McCullough versus Maryland, you know, they sent the National Guard into the bank and they yanked $10 million out of the vault. And uh, McCullough wants his $10 million back. John Marshall, Supreme Court Justice, said the ability to tax is the ability to destroy. And we can't have you states interfering with us, the federal government, the conduct of our business. But if you don't bother us, we won't bother you. You leave us alone, we leave you alone. So how does that relate to muni bond? My state could tax me on the interest I'm receiving, but chooses not to, to give me an incentive to invest in my home state. Again, this idea of reciprocity or reciprocal immunity, meaning states leave the feds alone, the fed leaves the states alone, doesn't apply state to state. So, you know, if I'm a California resident, I buy a Nevada bond, California can and will tax me. It applies state to local. So uh, the feds would like to tax me, but can't. And it also relates to treasury securities. In a treasury security, the U.S. government can and will tax me. States would like to, but can't. So that's the second thing they're going to opine about. The third thing they're going to opine about is they have the legislative authority to borrow the money to issue the bonds. Now, if that's a GO bond, that means there was a vote and the voters said, let's do it. If it's a revenue bond, it does that, in, uh, that, that authority, that transportation district or that airport or you know, whatever it happens to be, have the authority to issue the bonds. I was just reading now where there's a bond council uh, and a legal opinion that's being uh, challenged in the state of Georgia about whether this community outside Georgia has the authority to issue $200 million worth of bonds to build an uh, electric vehicle uh, factory for an electrical uh, car maker. You know, and that's what the bond council has said. They do have the authority and people are saying, eh, I'm not so sure. Now, very testable, when you hire an attorney, what is better when the law firm gives you a unqualified opinion or when they give you a qualified opinion, what do you want? Yeah, unqualified test question means without reservation. You know, that's what I wanna hear from my attorney. You know, my attorney's name is Jim and he says, Dean, there is no doubt about what the law says here. I'm willing to litigate that on your behalf uh, to a successful conclusion. You know, then sometimes Jim will say, Dean, I'm willing to litigate until you run out of money. You know, that's with reservations. You know, for example, uh, Sacramento asked its residents several times, several times, if the taxpayers of Sacramento would provide financial assistance to the Sacramento Kings to build a stadium. And several times those voters said no. You know, and then Kevin Johnson, the mayor, said, uh, we're going to do it anyways with the uh, authority of the city council. Now, uh, the legal opinion there, the uh, law firm uh, qualified it and said, I'm not sure this is a binding debt on these taxpayers because, you know, they were asked three times. They said no. And the city council said yes, but I'm not so sure they have the authority to bind debt to the taxpayers of Sacramento. Now, it's never a problem until the bonds default. From what I understand, the bonds are fine. But, you know, that would be something you certainly want to know uh, before you buy those bonds. OK, so there's two ways to proceed when we're underwriting securities negotiated versus competitive. 
You know, uh, I appreciate some of you have uh, purchased tutoring from me. Uh, you've uh, participated in this class and paid for the class, and I appreciate that. But I don't negotiate. So, you know, if somebody comes to me and says, Dean, you know, I can get a tutor for a lot less money. I'm like, well, I'm not surprised you can, but I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, you know, negotiate would mean, okay, I'm willing to, you know, I'm flexible on that. You know, what What do you got in mind? You know, for example, I had the, I thought it was kind of clever. They, they said, Dean, can I get a quantity? Dis if I buy X number of hours, can I get a reduced rate? I said, oh, that's kind of fun. You're asking me, do I have a break point <laughs> for a quantity discount? I said, I do not, but I have rights of accumulation. You know, you prove to me you're a good customer, then, you know, I'm willing to do that. Now, in my example, the city of San Francisco, Negotiated would mean we just call in Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and we work with them. You know, the state of California underwrites all its bonds on a negotiated basis. And so that means the, uh, the underwriters for the state of California are JP Morgan and Bank of America. The state of California does not put their bonds out to a competitive bid. I think a good example would be like if I wanted to get a mortgage. You know, one way I can get a mortgage is walk to my bank where I have a relationship and say, I want a mortgage. They said, well, Dean, are you going to shop around? I say, no, but if I find out that you didn't give me a good deal, you're going to lose this and every other relationship I have with you. I expect you to do a good, good deal with me. Or I say, well, no, don't kid yourself. I mean, the minute I walk out of here, I'm going to call a mortgage broker. And I'm going to have them shop around and see who can get me the uh, mortgage at the lowest interest cost. So there's advantages and disadvantages to negotiated versus competitive. Right now, competitive, that's where, again, remember, you have your financial advisor as an issuer to help you here. And Morgan Stanley might say, you know what we should do? Let's put it out to competitive bid. Let's put a notice of sale test question in the bond buyer. Let's put a notice of sale in the bond buyer. A couple of test questions there. Notice of sale means we're, we're moving forward on a competitive basis. And then the second test question is, oh, the bond buyer is a newspaper widely read in the municipal market. Now, if it's negotiated, there'd be no notice of sale on the bond buyer. Now, various people, if you're in the muni business, you must subscribe to the bond buyer because you got to know what's happening. I kind of joke as the daily racing form is to people who bet on ponies, so is the bond buyer to people in the municipal finance business. They got other things in there besides that. Now, I'm dating myself. I go back far enough in time where there was a physical dead tree version of the bond buyer. And when I walked down the financial district, I would see that physical copy of the bond buyer. Don't get me started as the old dude, because I miss the thump on my door in the morning with my paper, you know, but you know, that's just not how the world works anymore. But anyways, with 100% accuracy, if I had that label and your name was on it, I would be willing to know that you are in the municipal market because otherwise you wouldn't subscribe to that. You know, I kind of like to look at it still for fun, but it's a must have if you're in the bond business. So. I'd be prepared for a question that says a newspaper widely read in the municipal market is A, the Wall Street Journal, B, USA Today, C, the Los Angeles Times, the bond buyer, ding, 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 ding. Now, since we're all subscribing to it, let's say that I work public finance at the Bank of America. And uh, I at Bank of America call up uh, uh, Raymond James. And I say to Raymond James, hey, did you get the bond buyer? Did you see the notice of sale? I'm forming a syndicate. Would you like to join my syndicate? And uh, Raymond James says, well, sorry, Dean, we're forming a competing syndicate. I said, well, say it ain't so. So there'll be various syndicates forming to bid on these bonds. By the way, from the issuer's perspective, that's what you'd like, right? You'd like you know, competition and a lot of syndicates. And I say to Raymond James at Bank America, I say, well, listen, uh, if I win the underwriting, would you still like to help sell bonds as a non-syndicate member? And Raymond James says, yeah, we got lots of customers who like tax-free income, certainly. And Raymond James says, Dean, if uh, we win, would you still like to help sell as a non-syndicate member? I say, yeah. I say, okay, tell you what, if uh, I win, either myself or one of my syndicate members will call you and they will put you in their selling group, their selling group. So, you know, you can't be on the sink that ship is going to sail here in a minute when we find out who wins the underwriting. So the one who wins the underwriting is the one who provides the issuer with the lowest net interest cost. I wouldn't worry about that too much. What I mean by that is, you know, I just, uh, what, I continually go on some of these rants, but one of my favorite rants is that these test prep vendors have lots of questions that I call legacy questions 
from the old Series 7 and not the new Series 7, or I should say current Series 7. Because uh, in the old version, the MSRB wouldn't recognize your 7 unless it had 55 questions on millions. But in that era, it was a 250 question exam. So there are lots of muni minutia questions that you no longer get asked. Don't get me wrong, there's still a lot of muni questions, but you're not gonna have to like calculate the mill rate or the property tax. Uh, another one that I get heat on is I have a, a lecture on memory aid devices for the test. And so he goes, you don't have pro golfers don't miss or pretty girls date more, or pretty guys drive Mercedes. I go, I don't have it because nobody's seen it in years as a, on the actual exam. It went, you know, the way of, uh, uh, the dinosaur, so to speak. So just be careful you don't get too in the weeds. Uh, you know, some of you are using test prep vendors who have a lot of minutia. All right, so here's an example. It's not a coincidence that this slide looks like network marketing. Are you familiar with network marketing? You know, it's kind of like Mary Kay Cosmetics and Bank of America here, BAMO, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch is Mary Kay. It doesn't matter who sells Mary Kay Cosmetics, Mary gets her piece right on, Megan. It's a pyramid scheme indeed. And what you work hard, Megan, to get to the top of the pyramid. You know, I was watching a Soprano uh, episode and uh, Tony and his nephew, Chris, had done a deal. And uh, he said to Tony, Chris, are we going to split any of the spread with other members of our syndicate? And Tony said, you don't understand how syndicates work. This is the Soprano syndicate. I'm the manager. I don't kick down, people kick up. In other words, the only person who can collect the entire spread is gonna be the person at the top of this pyramid, in this case, Bank of America. Now we're underwriting $100 million worth of bonds here. Now, one thing you wanna be able to do on your exam is because they do have questions about compensation, is you wanna be able to take your calculator and figure out how many bonds there are. And so what I'm gonna do is take my calculator, I'm gonna take 100 million, and I'm gonna divide that by par, what is par? Chat is open. What is par? Or bonds. Right on, Erica. Right on. Good job, Edward. 1,000. And when I do that, I find out that we are actually uh, doing 100,000 bonds here. And that's important because I'm going to say, uh, BAML, I'm going to call UBS. I would say to UBS, how many bonds do you want to take down? How many bonds do you want to take down? And uh, maybe, you know, uh, UBS says, uh, we'll take down 20,000 bonds, or in this case, $20 million. You know, UBS was kind of, uh, you know, nice here because they didn't ask me what kind of syndicate this was before they said they would take down 20,000 bonds. You know, so JP Morgan's in my syndicate, Morgan Stanley's in my syndicate. You know, uh, maybe UBS calls Fidelity and uh, says to Fidelity, listen, we know that you have lots of people who like tax-free income. Would you, Fidelity, like to join UBS's selling group? So, you know, we have participants here in the syndicate that you get tested on, and we're going to be talking about them at length. And UBS, uh, Fidelity says, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll help sell some bonds. We, you know, we'll help sell uh, 5,000 of the bonds. So, they, you know, they're going to sell those to their Fidelity customers. You know, and again, Fidelity doesn't typically do underwritings and neither does Schwab. So JP Morgan calls Schwab and says, hey, uh, we know that you have Schwab customers who'd like to have some bonds and we are a syndicate member and we have some bonds. Would you like some? And uh, yeah, Schwab says, yeah, we can, we can take some bonds. We'll take a thousand. Now, uh, remember, I'm the, uh, the top of the pyramid here, right? BAML, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. And so I'm gonna call Raymond James. And remember Raymond James lost because they didn't provide the lowest net interest cost. So I'm gonna call Raymond James and say, hey, I'm gonna put you in my selling group. So, you know, we have uh, participants here. We have the managing underwriter. I think of the managing underwriter in our example, BAML is first among equals. You know, and then we have our syndicate members and then we have members of our selling group. Now, the selling group members are not members of the syndicate. And that's going to be important as a test issue because you're going to get tested on liability of a syndicate. And so it depends on whether it's a Western or Eastern syndicate. So in my example, UBS said they would take down 20,000 bonds. Now, in a Western syndicate, 
What goes down stays down. You know, I think of John Wayne, Clint Eastwood. Mano a mano. You tell me you're taking down $20,000 bonds, UBS, in a Western divided syndicate. That's exactly what's going to happen. So syndicate members are individually responsible or liable for selling their bonds. You know, Western or divided. The members of the syndicate selling group are never liable. So in my example, UBS says, well, Fidelity didn't get it done. I said, well, sounds like a personal problem. Now, in a Eastern or undivided syndicate, we're in it together. I think of Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Mafia. And now it's not important that UBS said they do 20,000 bonds, 20 million. What's important is that that's 20% of the deal. You know, I had some uh, very high-end uh, lady investment bankers. They worked for a firm called Artemis Capital. And uh, they said they think of it as a family dinner. In a Western family dinner, all you got to do is eat your own meal, and then you get to leave the table. You know, in an Eastern family dinner, we keep passing it around and nobody leaves the table until it's all done, right? So let's say that uh, in my example, UBS took down 20,000 uh, bonds, 20 million of the deal. As we said, what goes down stays down. I'm the manager, I'm BAML, and I call UBS. I said, I've been checking in with all of our syndicate members and uh, you're the last syndicate member I'm checking in with. Everybody else has sold theirs. How are you doing on your 20,000 bonds? And UBS says, we, I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Do you have a mouse in your pocket? There's no we. You said you were going to do 20,000 bonds and you're doing 20,000 bonds. So in my example, let's say UBS. Uh, so, well, Dean, unfortunately, you know, we did uh, 10,000. And I said, no, you didn't. You didn't do 10,000. You did 20. And they say, well, what happens with the $10,000 or 10,000 bonds we didn't sell? Do they go to bond heaven? So, you know, they sold 10,000. They still have 10,000 left that they didn't sell. And anyway, you know where that goes? Where do those $10,000 other bonds go? Do they go to bond heaven? Are they up there with the puppies? They go into inventory. And uh, we call our brokers and say, attention brokers, blue light special, blue light special. So what goes down stays down in this example, test question, Western, uh, UBS is liable for 20,000 bonds or $20 million. Now it could be their benefit, by the way. You know, I'm calling a UBS and I'm checking in and I say, hey, listen, uh, I've got some extra bonds. They say, well, it sounds like a personal problem, Dean. I, we said we did 20,000, we did 20,000, we're done. Now, in this example over here, when it's Eastern or undivided, it works a little differently, right? So same scenario, UBS has taken down $20 million worth of the deal, 20,000 20, bonds. And uh, now uh, I call UBS and I say, listen, I've checked in with all the other syndicate members. How you doing? And they say, Dean, we only did uh, 10 million or 10,000 bonds. And, you know, be careful. Don't panic when you see it expressed as bonds or money because it could be either on your exam. But here, I said, well, you're not going to be very popular because now what I'm going to do is take the other 10,000 bonds or $10 million and reallocate it to the syndicate members based on their percentage participation. Let's try it again. So UBS said they do 20% uh, of the deal. Because remember, it's not important now that that's 20,000 bonds or 20 million is important that that's 20% of the deal. As you see here, you're responsible based on your percentage participation. And again, it doesn't matter. Selling group members are never liable. So that might be a reason to choose to be a selling group member. So uh, now I call up uh, UBS. I say, hey, Bamel here, manager, checking in with the uh, syndicate members. How you doing? And they said, Dean, we're done. I said, well, no, not really. And they go, what do you mean, not really? I said, well, remember, this is an Eastern undivided syndicate. And I'm doing reallocation. I have some bonds for you. And UBS says, well, how many bonds do you have for me? I said, well, let's see how you did on your Series 7. I'm reallocating $10 million of bonds. $10 million worth of bonds. So test question, what is UBS going to receive in this reallocation? So we have $10 million worth of bonds. They've sold their 20%, but they're still liable. So how much of that $10 million belongs to UBS? Right on, Megan, $2 million. Indeed. All right, so any questions on this before we talk about compensation?
who's going to get what. So what we're going to be talking about next is the spread, very testable. The spread is the difference between what the issuer receives and the investors pay. And then we're going to be talking about components of the spread. And again, very testable. Any question before I move this slide? Okay, so here we go. Here's our example we're working on. Uh, remember, I have the exclusive contract with the issuer. You cannot get these bonds without coming through BAML. And remember, we won because we gave the issuer $990 per bond. So as we said, the first test question is to be able to tell me on your exam, what is the spread in this deal? What is the spread in this deal we're working on? How much money is there to split up on each of the bonds sold? Erica, that's correct. But you know, no person in the bond business is ever gonna say $10. I mean, if you say $10 in the bond business, people know you're new. There you go. Megan sounds like she's a player because she said one point, right? So in the muni bond business, nobody ever is going to say $10. You know, it's important to know that in the bond business, we always talk about points. And so here the spread is indeed, Erica, $10. But in bond speak, that is a point. Not basis points, no. BIPs are different. Basis points, that would be 100 BIPs or basis points. So basis points are about yield. We're not talking about yield. We're talking about price. And price is a bond point. So those are different things. Okay, so now in my example, remember, I asked UBS to take down bonds. And they say, Dean, what can I take down bonds at? I say, well, as a member of the syndicate, I'm going to let you, UBS, have bonds for $991.25. You can take down bonds at 991.25. So it doesn't matter who sells what bond. As the manager, I always am going to get my management fee. You know, I was giving you my Soprano episode, and Tony calls it his taste. He says, I don't care who does what in the Soprano syndicate, I expect to get a piece. And so this management fee, chance to redeem yourself, what is the management fee in this deal we're working on? What is the management fee? Don't tell me a buck 25, because if you say a dollar 25, we're going to say you must be new, because that's not how bond people talk. How do bond people talk? They talk in points. They talk in points, right? So indeed, that is a buck 25. But the way that would be expressed in the bond business would be an eighth. Now, if you are struggling with how to turn that into a dollar amount, you can simply just take your calculator. Here's my calculator. And I'm gonna take one, divide by eight. One, divide by eight. And then I get that number and then I just times it by 10, which is the bond point, right? And that's the way I can do, do that. Uh, test question number two about this is the management fee is typically, test question, the smallest individual component of the spread. So they said, we're going to test you on these uh, components of the spread. And you should know that the management fee is typically the smallest individual component of the spread. And we said, it doesn't matter who sells the bonds that um, in my example, BAML is getting this on every bond sold. Every bond sold, where is my mouse? My... There it is. Every once in a while my mouse adds, adds, uh, acts up. I was gonna change the font size on that, but oh well. Okay, so now UBS has a decision to make. UBS can sell the bonds themselves and make the total takedown, which in this case is how much? The total takedown in this uh, thing is, by the way, total takedown, two test questions. It's not an individual component of the spread. But what is the takedown in a uh, total takedown in this example we're working? Boy, Juan, you're a player, player. Indeed, seven eights, right? 
And again, in bond, if you can't, if you're struggling to turn that into dollar amount, because remember, there are questions where I'm going to ask you, you know, what was somebody's compensation? And so you need to be able to turn that into a dollar amount. So on the bonds that uh, UBS decides to sell itself, I'm taking seven divided by eight. And I'm timesing it by a bond point to turn it back into a dollar amount. So if they want to sell the bonds themselves, they can make 875. But if they want, they can build their own bracket. They can build their own bracket. So we said UBS is going to be able to take down these bonds at 991.25. But remember, uh, UBS had somebody in their selling group. Do you remember who was in UBS's selling group? Do you remember who was in U, uh, UBS's selling group? Yeah, Fidelity. And so, you know, Fidelity says to UBS, what can we have the bonds for? And uh, UBS says, we'll let you have the bonds for 995. So Fidelity is going to get bonds at 995. Fidelity says to UBS, well, you're getting them from uh, Dean at 991.25 from BAML. We can just go to Dean Direct. And UBS says, no, 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 no. You, you can't get the bonds at 991.25 Fidelity unless you're a member of the syndicate and you're not a member of the syndicate. So whether you get these from Dean or me, you're still paying 995. Now Fidelity is going to make how much selling the bonds. And remember, Fidelity is not at risk for unsold securities. So on these bonds that Fidelity is uh, getting from the syndicate member, they're gonna make a half a point and remember that would be indeed $5. And as I told you, that's gonna be important because they might say, you know, your firm was a selling group member, your firm was, you know, the underwriter, whoever it was. Now remember UBS is still going to get three eighths or 375 on the bonds that Fidelity is selling. And the bonds that UBS sells itself, they're gonna get the entire spread. Now be careful, be careful on the exam what you're being asked. RTFQ. What I mean by that is read the full question. If I ask what is the largest individual component of the spread, keyword individual component of the spread, you would tell me the selling concession. But if on the other hand, I ask what is the largest component of the spread, that would be the total takedown. So just be careful on your exam about what you're being asked, because again, that would be different questions depending on what you're being doing. So I've made, I think, some uh, very good slides on uh, how this looks in terms of test questions. So we said there's two very important things we got to know. We got to know participants and we got to know components of the spread. So very important answer set. Again, I don't know what the question is. The, I'm hinting that any one of these could be the right answer. So chat is open. I say your firm, your firm, uh, was involved in a primary distribution of municipal bonds and was not at risk for unsold securities. Your firm was involved in a primary offering of municipal securities and was not at risk for unsold security. Are you A, your firm a selling group member? Is your firm a syndicate member? Or is your firm the manager? And you would tell me the selling group member. Or another way I could do it is show you as an exhibit what I mean by showing you exhibit, I could show you this exhibit and say your firm made a half a point selling the bonds and was not at risk for unsold securities. And based on this exhibit, again, you would say that would be my firm would be a selling group member. And then remember, I could ask you say you sold X number of bonds and uh, what did your firm make in compensation? And you would times that by you know $5 and tell me what the compensation was. All right, let's uh, try this next one. Your firm was involved in a primary offering of securities and was at risk for unsold securities. Your firm was involved in a primary offering of securities and was at risk for unsold securities. You would say the syndicate member or underwriter. Right? You know, they have a language. One of the challenges of the language could be a little different depending on the question. I could also show you this exhibit. I could also show you this exhibit and say your firm, your firm made three eighths on a bond that someone else sold. Your firm made three eighths on a bond that some other firm sold. Who were you? And you'd have to come up with, again, that's UBS giving bonds to Fidelity. In this case, you tell me a syndicate member. I say your firm made seven eighths. And again, you would say a syndicate member. 
right? Three eighths because of the difference between 991.25 and uh, 995, 995 is three eighths. Remember we said that's how we do that. So the difference between that and that is three eighths or 375, right? And that's what UBS makes on the bonds that they give to Fidelity. As we said, the other thing you have to be able to do is, okay, who's the only person who can capture the entire spread? Who is the only person that can make every component of the spread? And that would be uh, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, right? Because they're gonna keep some of the bonds to sell themselves. And so the manager is the only one who can capture that entire spread. But remember, they're making at least an eighth on every bond sold. So I could say that on the test. Your firm made an eighth, on a bond that someone else sold and was at risk for on social securities. An eighth is again, the difference between these two numbers. You know, that's what uh, Bank of America makes on every bond sold, right? And they're also gonna make, can make this if they want to, you know, by giving bonds, building their own selling group, which they're gonna do. And then where they got Merrill brokers are gonna sell the bonds and the bonds the Merrill brokers uh, sell, they make every component of the spread, every component. All right, another very important answer set is this one. Right? So be careful what I'm asking you. So I say on the test, which is the uh, smallest individual component of the spread? What is the smallest individual component of the spread? Right on, it's the management fee, D, D. They're not gonna ask you good news about the additional takedown in the middle, but you know they're not gonna ask about that. They're gonna ask either about the selling concession or total takedown. And we said, you gotta be very careful here. Because if I say, what is the largest individual component of the spread? That's A, individual component. But if I say the largest component of the spread, that would be C. I just gotta be real careful again, RTFQ about what you're being asked in terms of the spread. So the big test questions are participants in the underwriting and the components of the spread. Uh, again, another very important. Well, there you go. So if you're using Kaplan, Megan said she found the uh, latest edition of the bed, uh, book 515 that helped her uh, on this stuff. So again, they're going to torment you on documents. So, you know, I, I, someday I'm going to write a whole practice exam that just answer sets and there's no real question. Because, you know, the answer sets, that's what makes the test difficult. All these could be right answers to different questions. And we said the official statement, remember, is the prospectus-like document. And so if I ask you the prospectus like document with selling municipals, you would say A. Now the trust indenture is a different thing that's testable. The trust indenture is where we find the written promises between the issuer and the trustee for the benefit of the bondholders. And you know, that's an important document. It's not the official statement, but the biggest thing that we're concerned about in the trust indenture, if it's a revenue bond is what's called the flow of funds. You know, and so one test question would be, where do you find the flow of funds? You don't find the flow of funds in the official statement. You find the flow of funds in the trust indenture. And the one we're gonna be uh, concerned with is whether it is a net revenue pledge spelled out in the trust indenture on a revenue bond or a gross revenue pledge. Now we would always assume, we would always assume on the test that it's, uh, they're asking us about a net revenue because that's the most common one. And the test question, besides knowing that it's found in the trust indenture is which fund has priority. So, you know, if I'm the airport and I'm collecting uh, gate fees, I'm collecting lease payments from the food court and the retail, I'm collecting uh, money from the uh, parking structure, where does that money go first? Test question, we always assume it's net revenue. And you would tell me on the test that the fund that has priority is the operations and maintenance fund. So, you know, uh, at the airport, uh, San Francisco airport, Bank of America is the bank. And so, you know, when they collect the money, they go to Bank of America, how convenient, it's right there at the airport and say, here's our deposit for the operations and maintenance fund. You know, and then once they have enough to operate and maintain the airport, then we put money into debt service. So two test questions. Where do we find, where do we find uh, 
the flow of funds, the promises, and the trust indenture, and then can we distinguish between the net revenue, right? The syndical letter is what governs our relationship with our other members, right? So the syndical letter is the letter between Bank of America, UBS, and uh, you know JP Morgan about how things are going to do do things. And then remember the legal opinion test question is done by the bond council. So again, they're going to torment you on different things on munis and. It's kind of like learning a foreign language. They say when you dream the foreign language, that's when you know it. So I guess that's when you have your first uh, thing. Now we said the biggest uh, other thing, here's another very important answer set. Uh, the hundred we talked about, that's the gift or gratuity rule. Anybody know what C is the right answer to? Anybody know what C is the right answer to? Right on one, that's rule G37. So I'm the Morgan Stanley guy in public finance. And I say to the uh, mayor, I say, listen, I don't want to start over with a new guy. I mean, we do a lot of business together. And so, you know, if, uh, you know, you need some help, let me know, because I'd like to help you out. So the maximum campaign contribution that I, as a municipal financial professional, can give to a politician is 250 bucks. Now, be careful. It's not only 250 bucks. I have to be able to vote for the mayor. So if I'm not somebody who can vote for the mayor of San Francisco, then I can't give them anything. Because if I do, I'm going to break the rule, and then I'm going to be prohibited from doing underwritings for a couple of years. So. So I would definitely know that 250 as well. Okay, so let's talk about the, uh, the two types of bonds. So general obligation bonds are issued by uh, issuers that have taxing authority, right? So there's 50,000 issuers of municipal securities. Wow, 50,000 municipal issuers of securities. 50 of those are states. So that means 49,950 are school districts, you know, other people. And so we have taxing authority, we can issue the GO bond. And general obligation bonds are backed by the full faith and credit of the issuer. And three is a test question. We have to have voter approval to issue a GO bond. We have to have voter approval. What backs up a general obligation bond on the local level? You know, taxes are the price you pay for civilization. And the more civilization you want, the more taxes you're going to have to pay, right? So property taxes and a bondholder, we want to see if they have the ability to raise some more money. And so, you know, as I look at the uh, credit risk and lending this municipality my money, I say, what are the property taxes? For example, in San Francisco's credit quality is very good because there's a big gap between the estimated full value of the properties and their present assessed valuation. So that means as the properties turn over, San Francisco can get more property taxes. Uh, Detroit, Michigan had the opposite problem. You know, they have higher assessed valuations than the uh, property values. Ad valerum is Latin for added value, and that's what that property tax is, right? It's added value. So, you know, if you're in San Francisco, I was reading about an older couple, and they had a, a mansion in Pack Heights, which is the ritzy area of San Francisco. They bought years and years and years ago for 500000 And then they sold it to somebody from Silicon Valley for $10 million. Now, they're both paying three mills, but the point is three mills uh, don't worry about it. That's 0 0.001 of his valuation on 500,000 is nowhere near three mils on 10 million. Now, one thing that can help us in terms of credit analysis is what is the collection ratio? I'm not going to make you do this. I'm just going to ask you what bond does it go to? So let's say political subdivision A has a collection ratio of 98%. So that means only 2% of the taxes are delinquent. And community B, political subdivision B, has a collection ratio of 90%. So the test question would be, which has a better uh, credit quality? And it would be political subdivision A because they have a higher collection ratio. Not going to make you do anything with it on the exam other than just know that it goes to a GO. Now, whenever there's three of a thing, remember, except is the format they love. All the following are associated with uh, GO bonds, except. And, you know, D will be something that doesn't go to a uh, geo bond. Now, overlapping debt or coterminous. Coterminous is Latin for living together. Now, let's see if I got a slide here. I don't know if I did this slide or not. I didn't, so that just means we got to do a little more work here. So, um, coterminous is when two or more. Let's just put this definition in here. It's when two or more taxing agencies share some of the same geographic boundaries and are able to issue debt separately.
Uh, I would know that definition, right? Two or more taxing agencies. So I'm coming to you from Las Vegas. Uh, Las Vegas is a political subdivision. And Las Vegas is 100% coterminous with Clark County. You can't be in Clark County without being in, uh, and be in Las Vegas without being in Clark County. Las Vegas is 100% coterminous with Clark County. You can be in Clark County and not be in Las Vegas. You could be in Henderson or Summerlin, whatever the case may be. Now, as that relates to what we're discussing, let's say here's my house. And let's say here's the school district, Clark County Unified School District. And here's the boundary of the school district. And uh, let's say over here is a utility district. Obviously, I'm going to give it up my day job here. And uh, here's a forest preserve district. That's supposed to be a tree. <laughs> and here's the boundaries of that forest preserve district. And let's say there's somebody who lives over here. You know, he gets to look at the trees, but he doesn't have to pay for the trees. So overlapping debt is when two or more taxing agencies share some of the same geographic boundaries and are able to issue debt separately. So if I live in the unincorporated area of Clark County, then I'm not going to be paying those city taxes, right? So, you know, the, you know, as I joked, the taxes are the price you're paying for civilization. So uh, one other point here, uh, are states coterminous? Are states coterminous with, is the state of Nevada uh, coterminous with Clark County or uh, coterminous with Las Vegas? Alexander is correct. Juan is correct. No, because they don't have property taxes, right? States don't finance themselves with property taxes. States finance themselves other ways. So property taxes are for local government. You know, that's what you pay for local government. You know, local stuff, school districts, that kind of thing. Uh, some municipalities have a debt limit, some do not. You know, as a bondholder, a debt limit would be a positive thing because they can only sell so much money before they're, you know, got to stop. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Puerto Rico filed uh, chapter uh, nine bankruptcy, but I was surprised how much money they were able to raise before they actually went bankrupt. I mean, I thought, you know, at the, maybe 10 billion, somebody would have said enough already. You know, I think of it as kind of my like credit card, right? If my credit card has a, a limit, it protects my card company because they know at some point I'm gonna, I can't charge anymore. Where if I have a uh, card with no limit, you know, how, who knows what I can take them down for. Uh, budget, you know, municipalities are one of the few employers left still handing out defined benefit pension plans, where they tell their employees that when they retire, they're going to get a percentage of their base pay and health care for the rest of their life. And so again, this could affect the credit quality of the muni bond. Do they have unfunded pension liabilities? You know, the state of Illinois has recently upgraded to investment grade again, but for a while they were below investment grade because of the unfunded pension liabilities of the president employees and future retirees and the retirees already of the state of Illinois, right? So that's negative. Now, if you break into my home here in Las Vegas and I tell you I have a double barrel shotgun, I'm promising you that if I miss you with the first shot, I'm gonna get you with the second shot. So again, this is one of those things now where people get hung up a lot on the test is they think there's a zillion things going on and there's not. So let's just take a strategic pause here, a breath. There's only two types of bonds, GOs and revenues. Now, granted, now there's zillion subcategories. And so this is a type first test question of a GO bond. And the first pledge is going to be a user fee. But more importantly, if the user fee is insufficient, the second pledge is the full faith and credit of the uh, municipality. So on your exam, you should tell me that this is geo bond. Let me give you an example of this. Uh, I work public finance, I'm making this up. And uh, Salt Lake City says, hey, Dean, we wanna host the Winter Olympics. And what we wanna do, Dean, is uh, issue some revenue bonds. We wanna issue $200 million worth of revenue bonds. And tell the bondholders the interest in principle will be paid from the user fees from hosting the Olympics. I said, well, gee, that sounds wonderful. However, for every host city where it's been a financial success, I can to show you another host city has been a financial disaster. And if I go out there trying to uh, sell your muni uh, bonds as uh, revenue bonds just from the Olympics, I don't think I'm going to be able to get anybody to buy them. 
my recommendation is let's make them a double barrel bond. And they made them a double barrel bond. So if you bought this on your confirmation, it would say Salt Lake City Olympic, I, Olympic Organizing Committee Revenue Bonds, comma, a general obligation of the city of Salt Lake. Test question. Here's how I can test you on this. In this hypothetical, I just walked you through. Does this require voter approval? Do the residents of Salt Lake have to vote on the issuance of these bonds, these double barrel bonds? They certainly do. They certainly do because good news, there was a budget uh, surplus. But if there had been a, a budget deficit, they would have been uh, had to increase their property tax, their mill rate to pay them back. So yeah, they voted. 77% of the people who voted said, yeah, let's do it. So that is a form of a GO bond. So be careful, don't confuse this with a moral obligation. Well, that's an entirely different thing. You know, if I you break into my home and I say, you're morally obligated to get out of here. Yeah, that doesn't work, right? So uh, GOs can also be issued as zero coupon bonds or OIDs. Now, usually when you buy a zero coupon bond or an OID, you must accrete them. And here you have to accrete these as well, but the imputed interest is tax-free because it is a municipal. It is a municipal. Revenue bonds, on the other hand, we said test question, we gotta be able to contrast them. No voter approval is required. So I say to the mayor, what kind of airport would you like? Would you like a nice airport to replace your old airport, a very nice airport, or the nicest airport in the free world? And uh, you know, mayor says, do I have to ask my uh, taxpayers? I say, no, we're going to structure this as a revenue bond. So as long as it's a revenue bond, no voter approval is required. Test question, the user fees. Very important to understand on the exam. If the user fees are insufficient, the bond is going to default. So it should be self-supporting because if not, the bonds are going to default. Now I joke, I've never met a feasibility consultant that tells the issuer and the underwriters that what they're considering doing is not feasible. You know, the guy who's been on more bonds that have defaulted than any other bond, this guy has rendered more feasibility studies on revenue bonds that defaulted than any other person, hall of shame. And I love what he said in the interview. He said, I didn't say it would work. I just said it was feasible. <laughs> so feasibility studies, test question, go with revenue bonds. Where are their competitive facilities? As a bondholder, I'd like this to be a monopoly facility, but where else can people go? Now, I'm joking about the SFO, that's San Francisco airport. You can fly to Oakland, you can fly to San Jose. You know, uh, you're flying to Denver, DIA is it. Well, I guess you could go to, you know, Colorado Springs, but, you know, is it a monopoly facility or is it not a monopoly facility? I'm not going to make you crunch debt service coverage ratio, but I am going to ask you to recognize that it goes with a revenue bond, a revenue bond. So we said that's a big part of your exam is distinguishing uh, between that. Now, we talked about the trust indenture being very testable. And we said the test question that uh, is very high risk, high probability, is to know that we find the flow of funds in the trust indenture. And we said we always assume on the test that it's net revenue. And do you recall what I said net revenue means? What gets paid first? Which test question fund has priority? Which fund has priority in a net revenue pledge? Is it operations and maintenance or is it debt service? It's operations and maintenance. It makes sense, by the way, because you'd be kind of penny wise and pound foolish as a bondholder to you know, do that. Now, I am looking at my clock and I apologize. I appreciate you guys who are uh, being loyal with me. And I put these, uh, this is the first sequence through this. So, you know, uh, I don't know what my evening time frames are because I've never taught in the evenings. These are taught in four day classes. In fact, you know, one of the big mucky mucks at Kaplan called me and said, Hey, Dean, what is these evening things we see? <laughs> I said, well, I said, I don't think it's competitive because we're not doing a four day cram course. I'm doing these little evening things and seeing how it's going. And, uh, you know, Good news, I'm not actually an employee of Kaplan. They just hire me to teach classes for him. So it's not like he's my boss. But I said, you know. So anyways, uh, I the first sequence now, and the second sequence, I'll know our timing is what we can get done in the evening. So uh, remember, it's recorded, but uh, we're going to finish it up regardless of whether it's an hour or an hour and a half, whatever it happens to be. All right. So open versus closed. So open means we can continually issue new bonds as, lo as long as we meet what's called the additional bonds test. So, you know, I call in the chief financial officer. I'm the guy running the airport. And I say, uh, how are we looking on our additional bonds test? I want to build a new terminal. 
And he said, Dean, uh, I crunched the numbers and we can issue a, another $100 million worth of bonds without violating the additional bonds test. And closed in, we can only use it to make the facility operational. Once the facility is operational, then no more bonds. So, you know, this is uh, how it goes in public finance. I tell the mayor, I say, hey, mayor, I can build you a new airport, or I think we can build a new airport for $500 million. So we sell the $500 million worth of bonds. And I say, mayor, I'm sorry, uh, we spent the $500 million. We don't have an operational airport. He goes, oh, my God. I go, no, 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 no worries. I'm just going to sell some more bonds. So I sell another $500 million worth of bonds. We're at a billion. I say to the mayor, we spent a billion. We still don't have an airport. He goes, oh my God. I go, no, no, hey, it's good. We love selling bonds. So, you know, billion five, and now the facility's operational. Now we cannot sell any more bonds. Uh, I don't know if it's helpful. I think of open-end bonds for older facilities and where they're continually issuing bonds to modernize, updates, expand, whereas closed-end is typically newer facilities where there wouldn't be a need to do that. Call provisions are very testable. So a couple test questions here. One of the risks you have in a bond is called call risk. The risk that you're not going to get to hold the bond to maturity. Listen, if anybody ever asks you about economics, finance, or investments, and you want to sound smart, you should say it has a lot to do with interest rates. And they say, what about them? You say they fluctuate. They go up, they go down. Is that good news or bad news? So test question number one, Call risk is associated with what kind of an interest rate environment? Call risk is associated with what kind of an interest rate environment? Rising interest rate environment, stable interest rate environment, or a falling interest rate environment? You know, if I'm holding your mortgage and I'm afraid that you're going to call the mortgage away from me, in other words, you're not going to be paying me my interest in principle for the entire 30 years, under what circumstances, interest rate-wise, would you refinance your mortgage? No, you don't refinance your mortgage with rising rates. The issuer is going to refinance if interest rates go down. So test question number one, call risk is associated with a declining interest rate environment. Test question number two. The issuer does provide call protection. And so you say, hey, Dean, I'm afraid, you know, they're going to call these bonds away from me. And I said, well, these bonds do have call protection. Call protection test question consists of two things, time and price. I say, you know, they can't call the bonds for five years. They have five years of call protection. And if they do call them, they're going to have to call them and give you a little bit of a spiff. They're going to call them at 102 or 103, whatever the case may be. You know, so I call you and I say, hey, you know those bonds we bought? You got to Gandhi and I love the bonds. Interest rates have gone down. The bonds have gone up. The only thing I'm worried about is they pass their call protection period. I said, well, that's definitely something you should be worried about. You know, because that's why I've called you. You bonds got called. So call protection consists of two things, time and price. Now, some muni bonds have what are called put provisions. So call provisions, test question, are advantageous to the issuer. So that allows them to refinance their debt. So that's an advantage to the issuer to be able to do that. And you say, hey, Dean, uh, the bonds you're offering me have a higher price and a lower yield than other bonds I've been looking at. And I said, well, I'm not surprised because these bonds have a put provision. These bonds will allow you to put the bond back to the issuer. Wow, that's a nifty thing to be able to do. So in what kind of interest rate environment would it be an advantage? This is an advantage to the bondholder to be able to do this. And in what interest rate environment would this be advantageous to the bondholder? Rising interest rate environment, stable interest rate environment. You know, don't ever pick on the test, cannot be determined. I mean, that's never right. So, you know, you got you to pick something. <laughs> yeah, in today's environment, we're seeing a lot more of these, right? Because interest rates are rising. And as a public finance guy, I think, hey, listen, I think we need to add a put provision to this. I think we need to add a put provision to this. Uh, a catastrophe call. 
again, not in the official statement, it's in the trust indenture. That's what we're discussing right now. You know, we're supposed to disclose call provisions. You know, when we buy mini bond at a premium, we must quote yield a call. Test question, there's only one call provision that the MSRB says need not be disclosed. It's in the indenture, but I don't have to discuss it with you. You know, I was teaching a class in San Francisco and we were going over the catastrophe call. And I said, we know we used to have this beautiful tollway that wrapped, or ugly tollway that wrapped around the city. It was uh, ugly. It's called the Embarcadero Tollway. What an ugly concrete mess it was. Anyways, we had a earthquake and it fell down. And we thought, oh my God, this is beautiful. Now you can see the water and we decided not to rebuild it. We decided to build a promenade with some palm trees and a, a train that runs up and down the Embarcadero. And, and I gave the story, okay, you own the, the revenue bonds and you call me and say, hey, Dean, what's up with my bonds? I say, well, they're using the catastrophe call. And you say, well, you never disclosed that to me. And I said, well, you know, it's bad energy talking about natural disaster, act of God stuff. No, I didn't. And I don't need to talk to you about that. That would be in the trust interest. Anyways, this guy in class goes, well, that's why I don't live in California, earthquakes. I said, well, you know, I was going to let him slide. I said, where do you live? He said, well, I live in Oklahoma. I go, well, don't you guys like have tornadoes or something? I mean, you know, so test question, that need not be disclosed. Every other call provision certainly needs to be disclosed to a customer. Okay, very testable, uh, very testable. So again, following documents, I told you they love to torment you. You should definitely uh, know it's not the prospectus, but which of the following documents contains the written promises or covenants for the bond of, uh, FBO means for the benefit of the bondholders? Is it the official statement? Eh. Is it the legal opinion? Eh. Is it the trust indenture? Ding, 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 ding. And I was tutoring this uh, high-end uh, uh, lady. She's a chief technology officer, the broker chairman. And I was having fun. I think it's fun. So, you know, I'm sure I'm teasing. Let me know. But uh, if she come up with the wrong answer, I go, eh. and then one day I got her on a bad day because I went, eh, and she just lost it. She goes, Dean, if we we're talking technology, I'd be in you all day. Eh, 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 eh. She goes, that's the rudest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> I thought, oh, my goodness. You know, so <laughs> if I accidentally offend you along the way, just uh, I ask for your forgiveness in advance. All right. So very, very testable. Very, very testable. So. Uh, I think Mr. Boeing would be rolling in his grave if he knew they moved the corporate headquarters of Boeing out of Seattle to Chicago. And before they moved the headquarters uh, to Chicago, they said, attention, Dallas, Denver, Chicago, we're coming to one of your three cities. What are you going to do for Boeing? And the city of Chicago said, if you'll build your corporate headquarter campus here, we'll build a turnkey to your specifications. All you're going to have to do is walk in and start paying uh, the lease payments. And they go, wow, that's pretty cool. So test question number one about an industrial development revenue bond, corporate credit backs the bonds. So how would I test you on that? Let me just give you an example. Uh, Boeing's credit quality is single A. City of Chicago is triple B. So are the bonds single A or are they triple B? They're single A. Corporate credit back the bonds. You know, for example, uh, Schwab, uh, Denver said, hey, why don't you come out to Denver and build an 80-acre campus? And they said, build an 80-acre? No, 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 we'll build it. We'll build an 80-acre campus for you in Lone Tree, Colorado for your Schwabies. And they go, wow, that's wonderful. And they say, yeah, we'll build it. You tell us what you want and, you know, we'll build it for you. We'll put in the furniture, all that kind of stuff for you. And you just make the payments. Now, Denver isn't on the hook for that. Lone Tree, Colorado is not on the hook for that. Schwab is. So corporate credit backs the bonds. Second test question. The bonds are supporting a private activity. It's not like building a high school. So, you know, the IRS calls these bonds private activity bonds. And so in terms of suitability, I wouldn't recommend this to anybody who's subject to the alternative minimum tax. I'm not going to get in the weeds uh, on the test about the AMT, but the alternative minimum tax is for people who make, you know, it's about a couple hundred thousand bucks you take deduction. I've got a year from my studio. This is only used professionally. And so I can write this off. But if I was subject to the AMT, it would be called a preference item. And they would say, Dean, no uh, home office deduction for you. And so it's a list of things that we make people toss off their tax return, which means they're gonna pay some minimum amount. So if you are subject to the AMT, this would be an unsuitable recommendation. 
Now there's another one that's very similar that the IRS calls public purpose, not essential. You know, for example, uh, we've provided here in Las Vegas, $500 million in uh, revenue bonds that were sold to build the Allegiant Stadium for the Raiders. Uh, that serves a public purpose, you know, 50,000 of us bonding with the Raiders losing another game, but it's not essential. It's not like building a high school again. Now we call that in, in plain English, that's called a stadium. And that too, would be subject to tax if you're subject to the AMT. So those are two things. Special tax, not a general tax, a special tax. Some call it, sometimes we call these sin taxes. You know, uh, I gave you an example of a special tax on the alcohol rehab center. You know, my friend Johnny, I took him in and checked him into the alcohol rehab center in San Francisco. And, you know, I told him he had a drinking problem. Listen, in my crowd, if we tell you you have a drinking problem, you have a drinking problem because we're not people that normally say that. But anyways, Johnny said to me, he goes, Dean, I feel really bad. Uh, all this infrastructure for, for me. And, you know, I said, well, Johnny, don't feel bad. We paid for this place. You know, that special alcohol tax in San Francisco is what paid and finances this facility. Now, it doesn't have to connect, but it makes sense, right? These would be uh, sin taxes like uh, killing, uh, burning dead dinosaurs. I'm joking, but, you know, a gasoline tax, a cigarette tax, an alcohol tax. A hotel tax? What are you doing in a hotel? They're up to no good. You should be at home. I'm joking, but those are what we call special taxes. Now, the test question is if the special tax is insufficient, again, the bonds will default. So we got to be a little careful because we make the alcohol tax too high, people stop drinking and then the bonds default. So we said that's something we got to be kind of careful of. A special assessment is against the benefited property. Now, uh, <laughs> I used to drive a, a, a highway called Highway 99 in California. So I'd come down from my mountain place uh, and I'd take 99 South. And then when you get to a little town called Ripon, California, you go right to Sacramento and you go left to San Francisco and I'm going left to San Francisco. But anyways, uh, the Flying J Truck Travel Plaza uh, went to the state of California and said, you know, this would be a great place for a Flying J Truck Travel Plaza. The only problem is, you know, left or right in this intersection, the on-ramps and off-ramps are for this little rural community, and we need 18 wheelers to be able to go in and off this freeway easily. And so we want you, California Department of Transportation, to revise that, redo that off-ramp and on-ramp system to make it easy for truckers, and we're going to build this Flying J thing. And uh, the Cal Caltrans, the Department of California's Transportation Caltrans, said we're going to do it. It's going to cost $15 million. We can in good conscience ask the taxpayers of California to pay for that because you're the major beneficiary. So they sold some Caltrans special assessment bonds. If you bought these bonds, it says Caltrans Highway 99 off ramp 56. And what they're telling you is that, uh, you know, as long as the Flying J pays the special assessment, the bonds will not default. This could be a community, it could be a, a factory outlet, it could be the Flying J. Again, the key test question is if the special assessment's insufficient, the bonds will default. Now, I usually, when I'm teaching a four-day cram course version of the seven, I say, would you like me to be morally obligated to show up tomorrow or would you like me to be generally obligated? You want to be generally obligated, morally obligated, and you may or may not get paid. So, you know, uh, a lot of times rural hospitals have uh, troubles because, you know, a lot of people don't like to go to rural, rural hospitals. They like to go to big cities with big city doctors. And so maybe it's a little rural hospital district and they ask the state legislature, they say, can we issue some moral obligation bonds? They ask for permission. The legislature says, yeah, you can do it. So if you buy the bonds on the confirmation, it would say something like John C. Fremont Hospital Revenue District bonds, comma, a moral obligation of the state of whatever, Nevada moral obligation of the state of Nevada. If the bonds default, then the state legislature is going to take a vote and they're gonna say all in favor of paying back the John C. Revenue uh, Hospital bondholders say aye. All opposed say nay. If there are more yays than nays, they sequester the money out of the general budget of the state and pay you back. More nays than yays, the bonds default and you don't get paid. So again, the test question is this whole process, if you get this, that whole process I walked you through is called legislative apportionment. 
So if they ask us as a test question, let's say which of the following is associated with a moral obligation bond? And you would say legislative apportionment. Now, uh, public housing authority bonds and national housing authority bonds are very testable. And these are uh, low income housing, public housing authority, national housing authority. And they're kind of a platypus. What I mean by being a platypus, they're neither fish nor fowl, but very testable. You say, Dean, uh, I'm worried about credit risk. What is the best credit quality possible? I say the best credit quality possible is that of the United States government. And there are three ways to avail yourself of that credit quality. A, direct obligations of the US Treasury, T-bills, T-notes, T-bonds. B, Ginnie Mays. And C, PHAs, NHAs. Now, if you're getting the feel for your test, I just gave you three things that have the full faith and credit of the US Treasury. So what kind of a test question should you expect when there's three of a thing? Direct obligations of the US government, Ginny Mays, PHAs. You got it, Megan. They love the accept format. And D will be something that doesn't. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, something that does not. Sally Mae that does not. So if you're looking for government credit quality, that of the United States Treasury, direct obligations of the US Treasury, that's T-bills, T-notes, T-bonds, TIPs, Strips, uh, B, Ginny Mays, very testable, and PHAs, NHAs. All right, so pre-refunding or advance refunding. So again, I'm trying to make money as a public finance guy. So, you know, uh, I call the issuer and I say, hey, listen, you got some 5% bonds outstanding. I've done some homework and uh, brand new bonds can be uh, issued today at 2%. And you say, well, Dean, yeah, I, so what? I mean, I can't call the bonds. They haven't passed their call protection period. I said, well, what I think you should do is hire me to sell some new bonds at 2%. We'll take the money, we'll put it into escrow. And that way, when the bonds have passed their call protection period, we can call the bonds. And uh, PS, do you have a debt limit? You say, you do. Well, listen, if you hire me to do this for you, this pre-refunding, raising the money before the call protection period, or advance refunding, there's no testable distinction there. Uh, the good news is you can remove that from your debt statement. So let me give you an example of this. Uh, Clark County, Nevada issued 5% bonds four years ago. The bonds mature in 10 years and they have three years of of call production. So Clark County can't call the bonds in if, even if they wanted to. Today's rates are 2%, but are expected to rise. What might the issuer do? What the issuer would do is what we're talking about, do pre-refunding. So there's our Clark County 5% bonds. There's when they mature 10 years from today. Here we are today and bonds are paying 2%. Uh, as we said, they haven't passed their call protection period. So what we're gonna do is sell some new bonds, right? We're gonna put those bonds into escrow. We're only gonna be allowed to buy state and local government securities. They're called slugs. So you, you can't have a positive carry here. And boom, those bonds are considered retired, right? Now the test question is the old bonds have to be quoted on a yield to call basis, right? Because the old bonds, these 5% bonds are not gonna mature, right? Once those bonds have passed the call protection period, they're going to be called, they're going to be called. Uh, we have insurance for municipal bonds, again, testable. So, you know, one of the largest municipal defaults in a long time was Detroit, Michigan, Detroit defaulted. And you call me, you say, oh my God, Dean, you know, were my bonds insured? I said, well, let me check. You know, let's see if there was some credit enhancement. <laughs> I'm joking, but, you know, there's a, still a lot of money in Detroit. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, the grandson of the founder of Little Caesars. Uh, we were talking and I was talking about how I missed Starbucks because I thought who would ever pay $5 for a cup of coffee. And the grandson of the founder of Little Caesars said, you know, Dean, my grandpa's the same way. He said, why would somebody pay five bucks for a cup of coffee when I'll sell them a whole pizza for five bucks? <laughs> so, anyways, uh, I say, hey, good news. Your bonds were insured. Now, the test question is, you say, well, what's the price? I said, well, no, they don't insure the price. You know, the insurance company is going to continue to pay the semi-annual payments and principal at maturity. So the test question is, what do they insure? Timely payment of interest in principal. What do they not insure? the price of the bonds in the secondary market. Again, very testable. 
there's about 50% probability on your exam. So the IRS doesn't think you take your last buck and buy a muni. The IRS thinks that if you own muni bonds, you own other things, which is true. And they think what you'd like to do is realize the loss on a muni bond whenever it's convenient for you. So, you know, I like to buy a block of these bonds for one twenty, dollars $120,000, get a higher than today's tax-free return because I'm paying a premium, and then take that loss in one fell swoop whenever it's convenient for me. And the IRS says, no, no, no. When you buy a muni bond at a premium, you have to do straight line amortization downward called decretion. Now, by the way, that's what that's not a test term. That's Dean. I can't tell you how many times he'll say, oh, you know, other people say, it's what is decretion? And Dean uses words other people don't use. Uh, I like the word because we have straight line amortization upward. That's called accretion. This is straight line down amortization downward called decretion, decrease. Now, uh, this is again 50% practical application that you might have to do this. So it's like the first step of yield to maturity. So the first thing I have to be able to do on the test is recognize that this is a muni bond purchased at a premium. So that's the first test question. I debate whether I should even show this to you because if you start decreting everything you bump into, you're gonna get more questions wrong than right. So this is indeed a muni bond purchased at a premium. So when I buy that muni bond at a premium, I'm losing $200 over the remaining life. So that's our first step. I gotta figure out how much I'm gonna decrete each year. So at the end of year one, my cost basis is 1180. At the end of year two, it's gonna be 1160. By the way, if I hold it to maturity, I'm gonna have neither a loss nor a gain because I would have decreted it down to par. So I'm gonna have it for $20 a year. So in the question, it says, I've held it for six years. So if I've held that for six years and I'm decreting $20 a year, I should have adjusted my cost base by 120. So that's my second step is to figure out my adjusted cost base. My adjusted cost base is 1,080. Then the test question says I sell it for 110. So my cost base is 108, 1,080, and I sell it for 110, that's a $20 gain, right? So about 50% probability you're gonna have to do that. So what I mean by that is when I debrief people, did you have to decree? You know, half the time they say yes, half the time they say no. So. You know, for what's worth. Now, by the way, you want to be able to get practical application questions correct, right? So, you know, as we said, it's three steps here. You got to recognize it's a muni bond purchased at a premium. So you got to slow down, by the way. There's a lot of intermediate steps here. I bought it at 120. So I say, okay, it's a muni bond at a premium, 10 years to maturity. Okay. So I'm going to have to figure out how much each year, and then I'm going to times it by six, and I'm going to figure out what that cost base is versus 110. If you miss this completely, you would have answered, I lost 100 bucks. I bought it for 1,200, 120% of par. I sold it for 110, 110% of par, par, and I lost 100. All right, so, you know, it's uh, easy to fall into that trap. Okay, suitability. The number one reason that people buy muni bonds is because the interest is federally tax exempt. Very testable. State and local depends on where you live and what kind of bond you buy. Now, what I mean by local is you live in New York City or Philadelphia, they have city income taxes. That's rare, but there are cities that have city income taxes. So, you know, we could be in a situation where it's triple exempt instead of double exempt. And if we want to diversify you outside of your home state, we could do so through territorial bonds like Puerto Rico, for example. This is very testable. So, you know, I need to be able to figure out what is a 6% bond worth after you pay your taxes on it? What is your after-tax return? So I'm going to ask you, what is your tax bracket? The higher tax bracket, the more suitable a muni is going to be. You know, it's not going to be suitable for somebody in a low income tax bracket. You know, we don't have anything against poor people. We just don't like talking to them. I'm joking. But, you know, if I was going to get back in the business, I'd probably grab some munis and, you know, find some rich people. Right. So when you get a 6% corporate bond, that's taxable. So that coupon is $60, 6% of par. But in a 40% tax bracket, that means you're going to pay $24 in taxes. So after that, you're left with $36. So, you know, we're trying to decide, well, should you buy the corporate bond or should you buy this 3% muni? And here we say, well, that's $30. You pay no taxes and you're left with 30. So it looks like this person should buy the 6% corporate bond because even after paying taxes, they're making more money. 
Now, you're going to have to do some math here to determine suitability. We kind of like that there's math involved because that means that uh, there's only one right answer. And so anytime on the test, they give you the percentage of the tax return, you know immediately that you're gonna get asked this question. So as a test taker, they say you're in a 40% tax bracket. You go, oh, here it comes. So they're either gonna give you a taxable yield and ask you the tax-free equivalent, or they're going to give you tax-free and ask you the taxable equivalent. So you're either gonna multiply or divide. So let's say we're considering, let's say we're considering uh, buying a 7% corporate bond. And remember that's a taxable yield on that corporate bond. And I say, well, listen, uh, what a tax bracket are you in? Now, in terms of math, you always do the thing in the parentheses first. And so here you would take 100% minus the tax bracket, 40%. And that would give us the answer to what it is worth getting seven and bank taxes. So as I said, what you're going to do first is you're going to take that and do the parentheses, right? So the parentheses is going to be 0 0.60 or 60 cents. So you don't get to keep the dollar. You're giving 40 cents of the dollar or 40% back. And again, what we're trying to solve for is what that's worth. So I'm going to take my calculator and I'm going to take 7% times 0 0.60. And I find out that's 4.2. So after you pay your taxes on a 7%, your real rate of return, your after tax return is 4.2. Now, the point of that, again, is that if we can find muni paying five, that's what you should do. You know, if we find uh, muni paying four, then you should buy this. So we're using this to make a decision about how to proceed. Now, the other way to do this is to get the tax for yield. So maybe on the test, I say you're considering a 3% muni. And so 3% muni, remember that 3% is tax-free. And so now I'm going to divide. So we're either gonna multiply or divide depending on which way we're going here. And so now we're gonna divide that by 100% minus the tax bracket. As we said, you always do the parentheses first. So we're gonna take our 100% minus the tax bracket, which in this case is 40%. That's given information and we get 0 0.60. And now I'm just gonna take my calculator and what I'm solving for here is, you know, 3% and not paying taxes is worth what, right? It's worth more than three. By the way, that's another test taking trick, by the way. You can shop the answer set based on the taxable yield, like the 7% yield, and you can eliminate anything that isn't less than seven. That can get you a 50-50. And here you can eliminate anything that is less than three, right? Because Based on the math, it's going to be a bigger number. So here I'm going to take three, I'm going to divide by 0 0.60, and that's the equivalent of getting 5% taxable. So uh, should this guy uh, buy the 3% muni or the 7% taxable bond? What should this guy buy if he's in a 40% tax bracket? Should he buy the 7% taxable or should he buy the 3% tax free? What should the guy do? Should he do, you know, this? Should he do this, or should he do this? Yeah, he should do the muni, and let's just label that. That's the tax-free or taxable equivalent. I don't have any draw, draw on which you're not going to have to do that. Okay, so we're almost done. I appreciate your patience with me. Uh, you know, finding out how long it takes us to get through these evening lectures. Uh, 529 is very testable. These are considered municipal securities. These are state-sponsored municipal fund securities. Remember, that means no prospectus. There's, you know, because they aren't they're municipal securities. By the way, if if the MSRB says it's a municipal security, it's a municipal security. You know, they're the ones who decide that. And you know, what you're gonna have to do on the test is contrast a 529 with a coverdale. And a coverdale is a much better deal because you can shelter a lot more money in this thing or take money out of this thing, right? So that's why you, you know, would tell me on the test, the 529 is better deal. And then you can use distributions for qualified educational expenses. And uh, as I said, you can do a prepaid plan as well. If you do a prepaid plan, whoop, uh, you have inflation protection. Uh, make sure you know about bands, tans, and rands. These are very testable. These are municipal money market securities. They even have the cash flow for a municipality. 
I told you that JP Morgan and Bank of America are the underwriters for the state of California. And many, many times the state will say to JP Morgan and Bank of America, can we have a cash advance against the bonds that you're underwriting? And JP Morgan and Bank of America say, no problem. Here's a couple billion dollars. We want in return a bond anticipation note. And then when we sell the bonds, we want back our money and a little interest. You know, we're anticipating taxes, but we'd like a cash advance. I think this is the Muni equivalent of borrowing against receivables. You know, so they uh, go to a money market fund manager, say, hey, how about I get you some tans, give me some money. Trans, tax revenue anticipation notes. Now, these have different ratings. You know, we have Moody's and we have Standard Poor's, but these have test question, what are called MIG ratings. And that's a unique credit rating associated with a municipal uh, uh, TANS, BANS, and RANS. So, you know, MIG-1 would be better than MIG-2. That stands for Moody's Investment Grade. But I would know that they have their own unique credit rating. And then we have local government investment pools where cities and counties and school districts pool their resources. It's the equivalent of a money market fund for cities and counties and states to, you know, short-term make some money on their, you know, money they need to pay their teachers and firemen and police and all that kind of stuff as well. Uh, we said the MSRB uh, decides on uh, rules. They don't have enforcement power, test question. All they do is publish rules. So who enforces the rules? Well, if you're a bank, it's going to be the Federal Reserve Board, the FDIC, and Comptroller Currency. If you're a broker-dealer, it's the SEC and FINRA. And we have discussed some of these rules along our evening. Uh, but, you know, the MSRB has customer confirmations. By the way, the FINRA has equivalent rules. So it's not do you know whose rule it is. It's do you know the rules. and you know, we said uh, you should definitely know QCIPs. Every security has its own unique identifying number. That's important. Are we talking about Orange County, New York, Orange County, Florida, Orange County, California? Are we talking about Portland, Maine or Portland, Oregon? Are we talking about uh, Oakland, Illinois or Oakland, California? So if we're in doubt about what security we're discussing, I'd say, what is the QCIP? And then you and I know we're talking about the same thing. If you get this as a test question, They'd say each security has its own unique identifying number known as, and you'd say QCIP. Now, I would flunk you on the entire exam if you don't know settlement date under the Uniform Practice Code for corporates and munis. Does everyone have a chance of embarrassing themselves in the chat and telling me when settlement date is for corporates and munis? T plus... Did you guys go, I'll go home already? <laughs> T plus two. So this is going to be on your customer confirmation, uh, on your customer confirmation, right? And it is indeed T plus two. Uh, this is very testable. The one we need to worry about here on our exam is these premium bonds. It's very testable to be able to point out a bond at a premium. This is not a lecture tonight about teeter daughters. I'd be interested in your thoughts. I told you, you guys are kind of guinea pigs for these evening classes and whether I'm gonna to continue to proceed with them and how many of them they're gonna be. So if I mean, in, in theory, I could run out, run out, uh, put up an equity lecture and a debt lecture and do the teeter-totter at length with you. That's not what tonight's dis, uh, you know, dis, uh, discussion has been, but uh, make sure you, you can identify uh, bonds at a premium based on their uh, you know, relationship of those yields. Uh, so here we go. This is very much a test scenario. This is about, I think, the hardest kind of question you get on the exam. These are called judgment questions. So, you know, basis is the fancy word for yield to maturity. And so what I told you, you got to be able to do on the test is recognize which one of these bonds is a bond at a premium. Excellent. Excellent. If you can do that, Alexander, you're in really good shape. So he's correct, right? Because that's a bond that has a yield to maturity base of fancy word. And so based on the teeter-totter, again, not tonight's lecture, but you know we have that flat line and then the teeter-totter would say that we buy the bond at a premium, that this yield to maturity is gonna be less than the nominal. So excellent. I think that's one of the tougher questions you can kind of encounter on series seven. Those are called judgment questions. Uh, accrued interest you should know is paid by the buyer to the seller. We always disclose capacity, whether we got this bond from another firm uh, acting as your agent will be on the confirmation or whether you bought it from our inventory, you know, whether you bought it from the inventory, always going to be on the confirmation. Uh, the day to date when it starts to accrue interest, 
where the bonds have been called or refunded, X is Latin for without. So if it's a muni bond without a legal opinion, that would be disclosed. Don't fight this. The MSRB doesn't have a 5% policy. They just say whatever you're charging should be fair and reasonable. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, on this exam, don't ever say we should be unfair and unreasonable. We should always be fair and reasonable. Uh, relevant factors in terms of whether you've been fair and reasonable in a markup or markdown is the fair value, the dollar amount, availability. Thinly traded securities have bigger spreads than widely available securities. Execution says value of your services. You know, you know, you know, I'm allowed to charge more if I'm, you know, adding some value there. Uh, we talked about suitability is huge on munis. Tax status is really important. There's no way you're not going to get asked that. You should never recommend unsuitable trades. And churning are trades that are excessive in size and frequency. Muni bonds are supposed to be for the long term. So for the most part, we would assume you're going to buy a muni bond and you're going to hold it to maturity. Uh, we talked about these uh, relationships. This is a control relationship. My broker dealer was called Gamma Global. And so let's say Dean sits on the city council and they go to raise some money. I say, hey, that's what I do for a living. So you work for me and you're selling the bonds. And the customer says, you like the bonds? You say, absolutely, we love the bonds. Dean represents not only our broker dealer, but also the issuer, City Hall. By the way, it's not only an MSRB rule. This is the equivalent of Bank of America and Merrill Lynch, right? There's a control relationship between Merrill Lynch and Bank of America that would have to be disclosed to a Bank of America customer, or excuse me, a Merrill Lynch customer buying Bank of America stock. And you know we wouldn't be able to do it on a discretionary basis. And we talked about my example of Morgan Stanley in San Francisco, right? You know, the BD and advisory capacity and the story I told you, Morgan Stanley may assist in preparing the official statement that only can be compensated as an advisor, can't switch roles, right? So I told you a good story about that. All right, well, I apologize. We have been running over in these evenings. I target them for an hour, but obviously I have to revise the timing of uh, how much uh, time you're going to be spending with me in these evening lectures. Is there anything else you'd like to know about muni bonds before we call it a night? Yes, no. Uh, I think the next uh, lecture we have in the evenings is either type of orders or margin. I think our next two that are coming. And then, like I say, if you have any input on stuff you'd like to see, uh, just let me know because uh, I haven't decided how many and how, what, you know, quantity or, you know, I'm just kind of making it up as I go. Uh, you're welcome, Megan. You're welcome. Uh, you're welcome, Edward. Thanks for spending your evening with me. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate you guys too, you know, uh, you know, uh, helping me kind of, you know, feel this evening thing out uh, in terms of uh, timing and, you know, add, maybe I could delete slides. I don't, the chat is open. If you're still around, I really like your input. Would you prefer that I expand the, the like when you signed up, it said an hour and obviously it'll be 90 minutes, but I could keep it at 90, but then I would just have to delete slides and talk about less. So the question, if you're still here in chat, I'd be interested, should we just keep the lecture, whatever the lecture size needs to be to cover all the ground? Or should we keep it at an hour? I mean, what's more important that it's uh, an hour or that it's it covers you know what you need to know? I, you know, I think there's there's value in both of those with 90 minutes in the evening. The other thing I'd be interested, good there, thank you, Edward. The other thing, um, other thing I'd be interested in is timing. We're on the West Coast here. I'm on Pacific time, but uh, I'm more than happy to start these earlier. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're on the East Coast, because now it's what for you guys, I have my clock here. It's 10 o'clock if you're in New York. Oh my God. So I'd be interested. Uh, uh, I, I don't think Megan, I'll raise the price because the, the price, I'm trying to make a, a combination because you know I'm pretty expensive on the tutoring front, but you can form syndicates. I had a tutoring session today, and their cohort is six of them all gone in on tutoring. So it's kind of fun when I show up. It's you know six people. So I don't think I'm going to change the prices. Uh, I have the margin price a little higher because you don't really need a margin lecture, but I know people want to be comfortable with it. But I would you know I'm going to tinker with other things. Uh, how about evenings though? Would you want to stay uh, start early or later if you're still here? And I'm just taking an informal poll. We started at 5.30. Is 5 better Pacific time or 4.30 or is this about right? Earlier, Megan? Yeah, so I'm thinking maybe we'll try out like a 4. Yeah, I'm thinking that, Edward, too. So I'm thinking if you're on the East Coast and you have a day job or you're in a mountain time right now, it's 9 o'clock. I think a 4.30 start wouldn't affect you, you know, or 4 o'clock start. It would affect the people on Pacific time zone who do have a day job and are working until, you know, 5 o'clock. So I don't know what the mix of that is. Maybe I'll put up a, a formal poll. 
So I still want it to be evening, Edward. But I'm thinking like if we make it at like five, even if you're on the Pacific time, instead of getting on the freeway for your commute in California, I could be on an hour and a half. Maybe you participate in the class and then you could take your ride home. <laughs> so yeah, I'm not going to make it a day class, Edward, because I told you, Cap and already reached out to me. Hey, Dean, what is this evening thing? And if I start popping up uh, day courses and, you know, cram courses, I think at that point, Cap was going to say, what are you doing? <laughs> so we'll keep it evenings. Evenings, we're keeping evenings. We're keeping the pricing. And uh, I think my type of orders lecture is only like, I think I made it 35 bucks. So I think that's pretty approachable. Uh, the other thing I'm trying to do is avoid monetizing the channel because I don't want the YouTube channel. I don't want to show channel memberships and hoodies and coffee cups and stuff like that. So this is a way to kind of do that without, you know, giving, uh, you know, I don't think uh, Alphabet, Google, YouTube needs any more money than they already have. So it's a way of not doing that and giving them 30% of whatever we collect. Okay, well, thank you again. And uh, like I say, I'll see you hopefully for the next lecture. Remember, I put up another office hour. Uh, the previous one is full, Eric. And as I told you, I know Eric is participating in that one. Uh, when it's full, I add another one. And so there's another office hour out there. there. Those are for paid students only. That means everybody here can get that free office hour that's capped at five participants. So uh, I'll talk to you guys later. Mom's got dinner running. She's going to be mad at me. She goes, you never get done on time. I'm like, I'm on, what can I tell you? You know, it is what it is. All right, everybody. Uh, like I say, remember inch by inch, your exam is a sense, yard by yard, your exam is hard. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.